Thank you all for coming. I'm Rick Caulfield, Chancellor here at the Univer University of Alaska Southeast. We really appreciate your being present with us tonight. And before we get started, I want to express my appreciation to the Ok Kwan. We have Ok Kwan representatives here with us. Gwyneth Chish, Ha Yi Ati. We're very grateful that you're here and that our university is located on the ancestral territory of the Ok Kwan people. I uh, also want to, before we get started, I wanted to uh, express my appreciation to Kathy Ruddy, who is here, and Kathy uh, was instrumental in helping bring Dr. Khan to Juno, longtime friend and colleague. So thank you, Kathy, for hosting Dr. Khan while he's here and uh, for being such a great neighbor. Uh, Sergey Khan is a professor of anthropology and Native American studies at Dartmouth College. He's a faculty associate at the Davis Center for Russian and Eurasian Studies at Harvard University. And here tonight, he's a visiting scholar at the University of Alaska Southeast, and we're very grateful for him, his presence here tonight. As a scholar of Native American ethnology and ethnohistory, Sergei Khan has been interested in ways in which Alaska Native and particularly Tlingit cultures have changed over time while preserving many of their core values and maintaining a distinct indigenous identity. He's also researched the history of the Russian Orthodox, uh, Russian Orthodox Christianity in Southeast Alaska, as well as of American and Russian anthropology, particularly the interaction between Boesian and Russian anthropology from the early 1900s through the 1940s. For a number of years, he's been preparing for publication an annotated book of photographs taken in Sitka by Elbridge W. Merrill, who lived between 1897 and 1929, and is involved in a large project on the history and culture of the Creole, that is Russian Alaska Native community of Sitka. In addition, he's recently been involved in producing an annotated multi-volume edition of the professional correspondence of anthropologist Franz Boas as part of an international editorial team. On this project, he's responsible for editing the volume dealing with Boaz's correspondence with his Russian colleagues. Dr. Khan's talk this evening is entitled, Richard Dauenhauer's Life and Work, A Beautiful Act of Translation. The late Richard Dauenhauer's major and best known scholarly legacy is his work with his wife and research partner, Nora Marks Dauenhauer. Together, they translated and published major works in the Tlingit oral tradition, as well as teaching and promoting Tlingit literacy. But less well-known is Dick's well-articulated notion that Tlingit oral literature was deeply spiritual world literature, and I think Dr. Khan's gonna be speaking about that tonight. In this presentation, Dr. Khan suggests that this spiritual grounding emerged from Dick's lifelong work as a poet and as a translator of poetry from several European languages, his academic training in comparative literature, and his profound religious faith. All of these strands of Dick's creative work, and they were many, as well as his deep commitment to living with his wife's extended Tlingit family, including some who are present with us tonight, and sharing its culture, were intertwined. For this reason, Khan refers to Dick's life and work as a beautiful act of translation. A close friend and colleague of Dick, as well as a Russian speaker, Dr. Khan will include in his talk tonight several of Dick's best translations of Russian poetry. So welcome, Sergei Khan. Thank you very much, Chancellor Caulfield, for this wonderful introduction. I'm delighted to be back in Juneau on this lovely campus on a Friday night when uh, there are lots of better things to do than listen to a professor from Dartmouth. But I think the subject matter, uh, the life and work of, of Dick Downhower, Richard Downhower, something that's important to many of you in this room, some of you knew him personally, some of you are related to him, some are dear friends. And uh, he was a dear friend to me, and not just a colleague, though we did do a lot of work together. Uh, his passing four years ago um, was a major, major loss in my life. And then, of course, three years later, Nora passed away. 
So this is a tribute to Dick. I'm really happy to be here. I appreciate the invitation. I want to thank Kathy for hosting me. And I could name a lot of people in this room, but I think our time is limited. So, um, A lot has been said and written about Richard's work, Richard and Nora's work. I've reviewed their work in academic publications. But this time, I wanted to take a different sort of tack or angle and look at, the, at his work, his ideas um, about Tlingit literature as world literature, not just distinct, rich, beautiful indigenous literature, but also part of, of the world canon. And that's what I'm going to try to do. And I thought, in preparation for the talk, I actually looked for Dick's translations of European poetry. And they're hard to find. There are bits and pieces here and there, but a lot of it's unpublished. It's in his archive. Part of his archive is at the University of Alaska Anchorage. They were very generous sharing with me um, what they have. Um, I wish someday we could put it all together. And I honestly think that his translations of some of the very well-known Russian poems, the kinds I grew up with, um, are better, more eloquent, um, they convey the, the feelings and the thoughts of the Russian poets better than some of the well-known, um, recognized translators who still work. Um, all right, so um, I don't have fancy PowerPoint. They, they take up time, and um, I think it's just a few images of my friends. <coughs> uh, that I could find in my files. Um, so uh, as the epigraph um, to the talk, I'm actually borrowing from Dick, from his dissertation, where he quotes John Chiardi eulogy to Robert Frost, one of his favorite poets. And it says, what better mourns a poet than an act of reading him again? so to be stored and restored by him. I think he wrote this almost 40 years ago, but it very much says something about him. So we're really remembering him. He taught here, he lived here much of his life. I feel he's still here with us. Um, you've already, uh, Chancellor already alluded to where I'm going with this talk, so I'm not going to repeat myself, but or repeat what he said. Um, how did I meet Dick? Um, in 1978, I was a graduate student at the University of Chicago in anthropology. I was uh, 25 years old, and I really became interested in Tlingit history, particularly relations with the Russian church, the impact of Christianity, and how Orthodox Christianity gradually became part of Tlingit culture, Tlingit history. Um, eventually, I also discovered that the tradition of the Kuh the memorial uh, ceremony, um, was very much alive, which I didn't know. The, my predecessors in anthropology described it as something from the past, but I found out that it, it was alive and well in 1979, and is even more so today. Um, but I wrote to Dick from Chicago, just asking him some questions, and he was very generous. Uh, told me that this work can be done, but one has to be very careful and respectful and kinds of things I needed to hear from an older colleague. Um, and then, <coughs> excuse me, in 79, um, I was coming to Southeast Alaska and eventually settled in Sitka for a year with my wife, Ala. Um, but we didn't have any money to get to Alaska. The funding was really miserable. Uh, most of it was from my in-laws. Um, who were not wealthy people at all. But my advisor came to me and said, my professor at Chicago said, you know, there's this woman who came to visit me and she's involved with the universe, which was a tour boat, pretty rusty um, old tour boat, not like these fancy ones you have now. And they needed somebody to lecture on, on Alaska and uh, on Tlingit culture and history. And so I said, no, I could do that. <laughs> So I just sort of made it up as I went along, but I did prepare a little bit. The nice thing about it was that they went from Seattle to Anchorage. I got off, and they, you'd stop in Juneau, and 
eventually took us to Sitka on the way back. And then a year later, when we were leaving Alaska, we took the same boat. <laughs> By that time, I knew a little more about local history and culture. But Dick and Nora were living in Anchorage at the time. This is 79. And so I had a few hours to talk to him. And I remember he said, it's Sunday, you should come to church, uh, the cathedral there. And I did. And then afterwards, there was a picnic. And he talked to me about the work. And he was very welcoming, very warm. Um, Nora was more quiet, but uh, eventually we also became good friends. And, um, but Dick, you know, he was just so open. And during that year in, in Sitka, in 79, 80, we would see them. They'd come into town uh, recording Tlingit stories. They also recorded uh, Russian Orthodox liturgy as sung, some of the psalms and hymns sung by Tlingit elders. We have those recordings. So um, that's uh, how we really got to, to know each other well. And he came over to, to have dinner with us, and I have to tell the story, um, and then I'll get serious. Um, as you know, Dick was Orthodox, Russian Orthodox. I'm Russian culturally, grew up in Russia, know the language, and I know the liturgy of the church, but I'm not Christian, I'm, a, I'm Jewish. Um, not terribly observant, but still. So this was Friday night, dinner at my house, at my apartment, across from the Russian church in Sitka. Uh, my wife, wonderful hostess and cook, she was serving pork chops, not a kosher food. It was Lent. And Dick said, you know what? He enjoyed himself immensely, but he said, if God is not going to strike us tonight for so many violations of religious prohibitions, we're going to be very lucky. And God didn't strike us. <laughs> we had a great time. And of course, one thing that brought us together um, is his own fluency in Russian, his love of Russian language and culture. And that's something he and I shared. So over the years, I'd come to Juno and stay with them quite often at their house. Um, this is a picture I took in 84. They were still finishing building the house, I believe. And we came to visit them. It was the only time we came back together, my wife and I. She's usually busy. And um, I love this picture. <laughs> we're all so young. <laughs> um, and I think they were delighted to be back in Tlingit country. I could just feel that this was home. This is Mark's trail, of course. Um, yeah. A little bit about Dick's biography. He grew up in upstate New York. And on his father's side of the family, he was German-American. I traced his parentage to Ancestry.com. Uh, his parental grandfather came to the US as a teenager. So I think German was spoken, at least among some of the older relatives. On his mother's side, he was Canadian-Irish. As Dick would mention in several of his interviews and public presentations, he had been interested in foreign languages from childhood. His early interests were European languages. He studied Russian and German in high school. In fact, as he said to me later, an important early formative experience was the time he spent as an American Field Service Exchange student in Germany as a high school student living with a German family. As he put it in one of his presentations many years later, this shaped his life a lot by giving him, quote, an appreciation for doing things in more languages than one. Not surprising, he chose to major in Russian as an undergraduate at Syracuse University and in German as a master's student at the University of Texas, Austin. There he also studied Greek. I found one of the poems, which I'll read to you, hopefully at enough time, that he translated at age 25, a Russian poem, a romantic Russian poem, well known to those of us who were brought up traditionally to, to read poetry, appreciate poetry. It's a love poem, and, and it's beautifully translated. I read it over the radio this afternoon. Um, I was interviewed. Um, Dick was very interested in writing in general, creative writing, nonfiction writing, but especially writing poetry. And so I think that gradually his love of foreign languages, of writing poetry, all came together in what he called love of translating poetry. He's a, these are his words. Incidentally, I want to acknowledge a couple of sources of, of interviews. Besides just conversations we've had over the years, I think uh, this book, a little bit of promotion here, sharing our knowledge, a volume of Tlingit um, 
on Tlingit, Tlingit and the Coastal Neighbors as a subtitle. And um, I co-edited with Steve Hendrickson, who helped me. And there are academics, uh, Tlingit scholars who are, or some are academics, some are community historians and scholars. A lot of people um, well known in this community. Um, Dick, and Nor uh, Dick and Nora gave a talk at a 2007 Klan conference about themselves. They were the keynote speakers. So that I transcribed that and got them to uh, edit it. And finally, it took so long, um, by the time the book came out, he was no longer here. So uh, I didn't expect that. But there are a lot of thoughts that I'm quoting here. And another major source um, is a wonderful video made by Lance Twitchell, professor here, um, uh, Language Warriors, uh, where they talk about their life and work. And of course, a really moving part of that uh, emotionally is the fact Dick is very ill when he's being interviewed, at least for some of the interviews. But he's still talking about what was important to him, about his passions. So, so Dick, very early on, he was already translating poetry from Russian, German, classical Greek, which he also studied. Um, after graduating <coughs> from college, he spent a year in Finland on a Fulbright. Um, actually, no, after graduating from Texas. And there he focused on translating Finnish and Swedish poetry. And I have a feeling that this love of the North that eventually brought him here to Alaska might have begun in Finland and, and Sweden. That's just my, my hunch. And of course, that then brought him to studying indigenous na native literature, Tlingit literature as well. Um, I'm going to read you one poem of his um, in very quickly in Russian and then in English. It's really nice. It's the one I was talking about, the romantic poet by, poem by Fyodor Tuchev, um, a Russian poet of the mid-19th century. It's a love poem. Uh, Dick translated when he was 25, and I found the, the original um, manuscript and it's dedicated to someone named Sandra. So this is before Nora's time. Uh, and the poem is, is, reads as follows. Um, it's called, I Love Your Eyes. Люблю глаза твои. Люблю глаза твои, мой друг, с игрой их пламенно чудесной, когда их приподымешь вдруг, и словно молния небесной окинешь бегло целый круг. Но есть сильнее очарование, глаза потупленной ниц, в минуты страстного лобзания и сквозь опущенных ресниц угрюмый тусклый огонь желания. It's very sexy, actually, for 1830. I love your eyes, their flaming, fascinating play. You cast your eyes and spell all other worlds away. And yet, there's a charm more powerful than this. Your eyes cast down, wrapped in kiss, and passionate embrace. Fire rises, and your eyes are lowered lashes, subdued infernos of desire. Pretty strong stuff for a 25-year-old. <laughs> Um, and you know, in Dick's poetry, he often turned to the subject matter of love, emotional as well as physical. And of course, a lot of his poems are dedicated to Nora, so I think something there. Um, Dick was also interested in translating the epics of non-Western peoples of Southern Siberia and Central Asia. He mentions working on the Buryat epic, Buryat or Mongolian language. Uh, he never finished it, but I know he was working on it. And he didn't know Buryat language, unlike the European languages I mentioned, but he was using a dictionary and worked with the Russian and the German translation. And I'm sure he would have done a great job if he had more time. It does make sense that Dick finally decided to pursue a doctorate in comparative literature. He was interested in linguistics, folklore, anthropology, but um, comparative literature, I would argue, gave him the foundation for a deep appreciation of Tlingit literature, oral literature, folklore. And he was also fortunate to one of the members of his committee at um, Wisconsin, where you went, University of Wisconsin-Madison, was Kitty uh, McClellan, a very prominent ethnographer of Tlingit, particularly interior Tlingit, but also coastal. And she was a younger colleague of Frederica de Laguna. 
uh, the great uh, ethnologist of, of Tlingit culture and history. In a way, Dick was fortunate, and so are all of us who have been engaged with and loved Tlingit oral literature, Tlingit language, and Tlingit kustii, Tlingit way of life, Tlingit culture in general. That at some point he ran out of funding. He couldn't finish his graduate degree. He needed a job. And there was a job at Alaska Methodist. I don't know if it still exists, it's Alaska Methodist. But anyway, in 69, he came up here. Some of you know this story, but some of you may not. And as he put it in his last interview in the Language Warriors, quote, when I came to Alaska in the late 60s, I was interested in Alaska native languages and doing something with them. Something like what I'd been doing with German and Russian. I was particularly interested in treating Alaska Native literature as serious adult literature. This is a very important point he made over and over throughout his life. My big desire coming to Alaska Pacific University was to, um, I guess that's the other name for the university, was to apply Euro-American Euro status to Alaska Native languages and literatures. Now, today this seems like a no-brainer, but at that time, he said there were a lot of people who translated or published Indian Native American poetry and, and stories especially, but thought of them as children's literature, stories about animals. Uh, and Dick very much objected to that, and he fought that. He argued that Tlingit oral literature from clan-owned sacred origin stories or legends, other types of stories, raven stories, songs of grief and love, and of course, ceremonial oratory um, that he found Southeast Alaska were unique. Um, and yet they, they also, they spoke to the culture and the people in the place, but also raised some very important universal values, talked about values, love and grief and sadness and joy, family, um, and so on. Of course, Southeast Alaska native lit language and literature was something he'd never encountered before. And he talked about how he was really drawn to it. And of course, um, he was also drawn to a Tlingit woman named Nora Marks, Florendo. Um, and I think that it's just really a lucky star that brought them together, but we are fortunate to have had that team, um, lifelong partners in everything with Nora's fluency in Tlingit and connections to Tlingit families and clans and her interest in recording and translating Tlingit oratory and stories and Dick's training in linguistics and comparative literature and then of course Nora's in anthropology as well. Um, they made a perfect team. Another important point that Dick made often in his presentations and his writing and something he brought from his training in comparative literature um, was the idea that um, stories, and including native stories, and particularly oratory, have to be studied and understood in the cultural context. They can't be just removed from that reality and, and simply analyzed and so forth. Outside the context, outside of understanding Tlingit culture, complex, rich, ancient culture, um, these stories and, and oratory um, lose a lot. Yeah, I think people often misunderstand them. And so we have the classics of the Tlingit oral tradition, those beautiful volumes that he and Nora published, um, and various articles in academic journals, his talks. Um, he mentioned a, a number of occasions that there was a, quite a bit of resistance in Alaska against his approach, uh, against teaching Tlingit language and literature, against treating these stories as serious literature, adult literature. Um, so I think he also was a language warrior, just like our friend Lance has appropriately named his video, I think. So let's look at some of the arguments more specifically. What, is he really what was he really talking about? Um, before I do, I also want to mention that um, having been at Dartmouth for 30 years, I 
take advantage of the opportunities to bring my colleagues. And so Dick and Nora visited us twice as scholars and a couple of times just informally. This was an endangered languages conference in 94, very important conference where both of them presented. And then we came over to my house and Mike Krauss was there, some Russian colleagues, and we had a wonderful time um, as I took that picture. So individual thinking storytellers, he would argue, have their own unique style. Each has their own unique style. They're not generic stories passed down from generation to generation. Each storyteller or orator, especially talented ones, the outstanding ones in particular, cast their own sort of shadow, have their own interpretation, a version of these stories. Here's a quote from Dick. It is important to feature individual tradition bearers to consider how they put their material together, how they think about it, how it fits into the larger world of theirs. It is exciting to explore how and why storytellers say things and how they use language. When we have the actual words of, actu uh, of actual storytellers, we realize how their style can be radically different from one, th and he would often present or in his lectures or put on, on the page, two versions of the same Tlingit tradition told by two different people, a man and a woman, um, two elderly storytellers, and then point out how there are, obviously there's a common theme, basic narrative, but then there are these different takes that a woman focuses on some things that a man does not, and so on and so forth. Dick would also not hesitate to compare the style of Tlingit storytelling um, to poetry of such giants of English language poetry like T.S. Eliot and Robert Frost, the British and an American poet. And I think to be able to make such bold comparisons and to do it competently um, in an interesting way, one had to be well versed in the Western poetic tradition, which he was, and of course have a good understanding of Tlingit. Tlingit culture. Here's an example. In his dissertation in 1975, finished in, in 1975, he compared the st storytelling style of two men, Robert Zuboff and A.P. Johnson, he called them master verbal artists. How different in some fundamental ways the styles of their version of a very well-known Tlingit story in the origin of Mosquito were. According to Richard Zuboff's version, was much more concerned with morality. Human, the, the story is about, you know, how, why do we have mosquitoes? Because there was this cannibal giant and finally was killed by a Tlingit hero and they burned the body, but the sparks and then flew and they became um, mosquitoes. And I'm, I'm summarizing very simply. But he says, for Zuboff, he's concerned with morality. Human beings, in his view, brought the calamity of the blood-sucking mosquitoes upon themselves. They are responsible for the origin of evil in the world, which in Dick's interpretation, I think he's, he's onto something, that Robert Zuba, without saying so, is talking about the fact that we have free will, that we, we brought this calamity upon ourselves. Dick was not afraid. He was comfortable making such bold statements and comparisons. Here's a passage from a long time with the same lines, same subject in, in his presentation that he gave in 2007 and that I published eight years later. Quote, we believe that individual personality is as important in Tlingit oral literature as it is in the familiar classics of world literature. We're used to asking how Tolstoy or Dostoevsky write about theology. We should also pay attention to Robert Zuboff in his story about the origin of mosquito, it comes back to that, when he reminds us that it was not God who created evil in the world, it was humans who messed things up. This is Robert's theology. We wouldn't have mosquitoes if we weren't for human greed, revenge, getting even, one-upmanship. It's also a master craftsman, I think he had a way with words, Dick that is. So if your life is going bad, don't blame it on God, it may be your own fault. The point is that the stories are not generic. This idea that traditional folk uh, storytellers in, in non-Western cultures just tell the same story over and over again. 
It says, no, they're not generic. The storytellers are not mindless, neutral pipelines through which the stories flow. Rather, the stories are shaped by and are part of the personality, the life experience, and the worldview of each. And they have different experiences. A.P. Johnson was, a, among other things, um, a lay preacher in the Presbyterian Church, and so Christian ideas uh, kind of came into some of his interpretations. Uh, this is very interesting, I think. On another occasion, Dick did not hesitate to compare an account of the famous 1804 Sitka battle by another master Tlingit storyteller, Kagwantan elder Alex Andrews from Sitka. He compared his interpretation, the way he told the story, the battle, to Homer. In Dick's words, Alex's account is a, quote, blow-by-blow -blow description of the battle. That's what he was interested in as a man. But Sally Hopkins, a woman storyteller, her version of the Battle of Sitka, both are published in their book on, on the Sitka battle, which came out about 10 years ago or so. Sally Hopkins, the Kiksadi lady, um, while saying little about the battle itself, provides incredibly detailed information on personal names and genealogies. That's what she was interested in as a woman, not so much the fighting. In fact, he says, if you don't read her account carefully, you may miss the whole battle. Because she's really interested in who was related to whom and who had children. It's a completely different uh, view, even though some of the same details do appear. And then my favorite passage, and this has never been published, and I wish that part of his dissertation was published at some point. He makes a very interesting, convincing comparison between a version of clan history narrated by a master storyteller uh, from Yaktat, all of Abraham, Hagat Keen, pardon my pronunciation. He compares his rendition, his view and interpretation of the clan legend, his own clan's uh, origin story, with T.S. Eliot. The central image of all of narrative, says Dick, or what I would call as an anthropologist, the master symbol of his narrative is unclean. The big land or the great land, uh, that's the translation, but it's also a reference to the name of a mountain inland from Yaktat. I'm not gonna read the Tlingit because I'm looking at Lance and I feel really awful that I'm gonna butcher the language. But here's the translation. And Paul Marx knows Brother is here too, as Lingit speaker, so I'm not going to dare to even try. Um, the great land it is called, and still it is, and still we value it, this land. Sounds, doesn't sound as beautiful in, in English as in Lingit, but still. So this is all of talking about the place. Throughout the narrative, the master storyteller describes how his people at some point in their history abandoned their original unplain the area of the mountain, and moved to Yakutat. And even though the storyteller says he still goes hunting there and fishing, um, it's no longer where his people live, his clan lives. Olive says that when he goes sand fishing in that area and looks up to view the Antlain mountain, he thinks of his clan ancestors, his maternal uncles, who paid for that land. And because of that, his clan has the right to still claim as its own. So this is a whole dimension of these stories that they're also, among, besides being great literature, they're claims, the proofs that each clan, each matrilineal family has the right to a particular piece of land and the stories that go with it and the crests that represent it. The emotions that the image of the mountain bring up in the storytellers uh, inspired him to compose a song. So he had a story and then he wrote a song, composed a song, all of that is. I look around the great land valley mountain. I imagine you there, my maternal uncles. That's the first stanza of his song. And the second one is, I look for you, Tekwedi Yathi, children of the Tekwedi. You give me inner strength. Now, analyzing this beautiful song and the narrative, Dick argues that, quote, the song concludes the clan history of the migration of the Tekwedi clan to Yaktat. This closing excerpt contains the most intense patterning of underlying oppositions running through the entire story and the song. 
It's present past, living dead, or ancestors and present day descendants, and ephemeral versus eternal. The composer, these are all Dick's words, the composer is well aware of the impending extinction of his group. It's a small clan and he felt, at least when he told the story, that the clan was, was dying out. And all of the imagery of his narration serves to intensify the contrast and make the sense of extinction more immediate. Time has now, in a sense, collapsed. And the moment of creation of a song is described. Then the song is sung. And in that song, we find the resolution of all the literary themes and oppositions. The song, says Dick, is a synthesis. Or to paraphrase Eliot, Time past and time present are merged in time future. The living composer, he goes on to say, one of the last survivors of his people, of his clan, looks to the land and imagines the deceased ancestors who lived there once. From that moment, the composer looks backward and forward, and all oppositions are resolved through the mediation of the land on plain, the great land, the setting against which the history has been played. Note that the first, in the first verse, the composer is addressing the man of his own clan, his maternal uncles. The living and the dead, everything's merged together. But in the second, he's addressing members of the opposite side, or the moiety, so that the Tequidi are eagles, and he's addressing the children of the Tequidi clan who are of the raven side. By means of this, suggests Richard, the imagery provides a three-step division of past, present, and future. The past generation, who are the maternal uncles of the storyteller. The present generation, the storyteller himself or the composer of the song. And the future generation, which includes, or at least in this case, he's addressing the children of his clan, which means members of the raven side whose fathers are Tequidi. And Dick adds that the tragedy and the irony is that with the extinction of the composer's clan, and again, I, it may be at that time, that's how Olaf felt, and that I imagine there are still Tequidis up there, but that's how he felt. That with the extinction of the composer's clan, there will not be any more Tequidi or Tequidi children left. It's a sad song in a way. And then we finally come to the point where Dick puts on his comparative liter literary scholar comparative literature scholar's hat. In his words, concepts of Olaf Abraham's narration and song, quote, call to mind some of the images and concepts of T.S. Eliot's uh, famous poem, uh, The Four Quartets. Why, asked Dick, why can we say that? Both composers, he, he goes on to say, are profoundly religious. Each is concerned with the question of man's place in eternity and seeks resolution of the problem of man's, or today would say man and women's, immortality, and a people's history and intellectual culture in relationship to the eternity of afterlife. The most general shared concern is with time and place. So then he goes to the four quartets, and he says, there's this famous passage in Eliot, where he says, <clears throat> Time present, this is Eliot, time present and time past are both perhaps present in time future. So past, present, future, individual, collective experience, right? Then T.S. Eliot again. Past experience revived in the meaning is not the experience of one life only, but of many generations. No, actually, I'm sorry. This is Dick's um, take on Eliot. So it's not poetry, it's, it's his. But here's the poem itself, and this is really important. Where time, space, national history or ethnic history and eternity all come together. And this is Eliot. <laughs> a people without history is not redeemed from time, for history is a pattern of timeless moments. So while the light fell, falls on a winter's afternoon in a secluded chapel, History is now in England. It's a beautiful poem. It's written during World War II. So just think of England being bombed by the Germans, Nazis, and, and he's writing this. And then Dick comes back and says, where, where poetry redeems an individual from time, 
History redeems a people from time. Both Eliot and Olaf, Abraham, Hagakin, combine history with poetic form and poetic expression. As Eliot says, England is nearest, but the experience is timeless and universal. For Eliot, there is a specific configuration of time and place, a chapel uh, somewhere in England. The one moment in a human life when on a specific winter afternoon, the light penetrates a specific chapel window in his country and allows for a kind of spiritual awakening. And then he goes on to say, switches back to the Tlingit narrative. He says, I would submit that the same is true of Olaf Abraham. The same moment of, in all its simplicity and complexity, its geographic specificity and its universality, its precise location in time and the timelessness which allows us even now to experience it again. And then, um, this is Dick the poet now talking. I really love this. Uh, and he ends that chapter um, on all the story. Quote, I have no idea what kind of day it was, but let us say when sunlight sparks on summer water and snow-capped peaks, history is now an enclave. So he brings it all back. And I think he could do that because he was a great scholar, a lover and scholar of Tlingit language and culture, and a translator. Um, a very different manifestations of Dick's interest in an ability to translate from one culture to another and to find parallels between them is his own poetic work in which he used, particularly later in life, imagery and metaphors from Tlingit and Russian Orthodox Christian cultural traditions or theologies. A deeply spiritual person who seems to have discovered Russian Orthodoxy while living in Alaska and that's when he, be, he was grow, uh, raised Lutheran, but he became Russian Orthodox here. At the same time as he was discovering Tlingit culture, Dick was not afraid of comparing the two, and so that, dis, that despite major fundamental differences between them, there were some striking similarities as well. In his writing, for example, he argued that both the Tlingit and other native Alaskan cultures, as well as Russian Orthodoxy, viewed what the Western world called the natural environment of Alaska, and he uses it ironically, as sacred. It's much more than just the land or the environment. The best example of this view is of Richard's is a beautiful section of his Glacier Bay Concerto series of poems. Some of you know them. And it's entitled, that section is entitled The Daughter of a Woman, Shawat Sik, which paraphrases a well-known Tlingit narrative which incidentally was owned by, or is owned by, the Chukunadi clan of Nora's father, into which Dick had been adopted. The Chukunadi woman who came forward to volunteer to stay behind and sacrifice her own life, an elderly woman, to atone for the sin of her granddaughter, a mistake of her granddaughter, who had violated an important sacred taboo and brought disaster upon her clan, the advancing glacier in Glacier Bay. And <clears throat> Susie James, a true Canadian lady who told the Glacier Bay history to Richard and Nora, and eventually they published it in their 87 book, Hashuka. Um, according to Susie James, the old woman in the story several times repeats the following. Take my, this is her rendition. Take my little granddaughter aboard with you. She's a young woman, the one that made the mistake. Children will be born from her but I will not leave to go to the boats. Whatever happens to my grandparents' house, to my mother's maternal uncle's house, will happen to me. So the village is being covered by ice, and uh, she wants to stay, but says, let my granddaughter, who's really the, the culprit, let her go, survive. If I had more time, I'd probably read the whole poem, but I can see that time is short. So in the Glacier Bay Concerto, he writes, Shawat Sikh, who entered once for all, for all the people of the clan of grass, the Chukunini, and all their seed, the children of the clan of grass, by her own blood having obtained eternal redemption. Now you can hear Christian theology here. Right? He goes on. Shawat Sikh, 
who understood without the shedding of blood there's no forgiveness. To mediate now the past and future and time eternal, humanity and ice. And this is sections of his poem, but we take it out of context. It doesn't sound like flowing poetry, but it is. And another quote, the future built on dying generations, like every act of love, like every sentence of human speech, the salmon runs and Shawat seek the daughter of woman and the child of man. Now in um, Le Chabet Concerto, the child of man is lowercase. But in a later poem published in Benchmarks, his last collection, a wonderful um, poem, rec uh, collection, recommend to everyone. In that poem, Casquet, he continued this theme of Glacier Bay sacrifice, described Casquet in a similar but also somewhat different language, which is more explicitly Christian or Russian Orthodox probably, more specifically. Kasgay was the Tlingit name of Susie James, the Tlingit elder and master storyteller who told the story to the Downhowers. It is the version in which the grandmother sacrifices her life to save her granddaughter. So it just elaborates on that. But in the biography of Susie James, which appeared in Dixon Nora's book of Tlingit biographies, Hakusti, he mentions that when Susie, who lived to be 90, died in 1980 at age 90. Uh, she mentioned her own feeling of her own impending death all, of old age as a tide gently lapping at her feet. Oh, that's a beautiful image there. Susie was both a very traditional Tlingit elder and a devout Russian Orthodox church member. And some of her descendants live here in Juneau, some in Sitka. Um, and that is the synthesis as well as a translation that Dick captures in his poem. So that's a passage from the poem dedicated to both the, the woman who had that name centuries ago, Susie James, who tells the story, and probably her name is being passed down through the clan, securely in the synthesis of Shawatsi and Jesus, the daughter of woman and the son of man. The son of man now is, is Christ, it's capital. Now, this is Dick's take on the poem, uh, and it's not academic writing, it's his po poetic writing. Um, but, and one could disagree with it, but I think there's something there, very moving, very profound. So I conclude, and this is my favorite picture of Dick. This is his last visit to Dartmouth, October 13, so he died less than a year later. I don't think he knew he was ill at that time. He was very happy. And we were just at a banquet at Dartmouth and um, having a nice time. We've shared a lot of uh, good wine and some Russian vodka together um, and had some fascinating conversations, including sitting in his sauna talking about these things I'm sharing with you. Dick was a true humanist who embraced another culture culture other than his own, and another religion, which he made his own, fully and with passion, just like he embraced Nora as his wife, his life partner, his colleague, his best friend. And her family, he embraced as his own. They didn't have children of their own, but they, her kids, her grandkids, they called him grandpa and father. Um, he was very much an adopted member of the nation and, and the people and the clan but very much part of it. So he believed so firmly in embracing that culture that's appealed to him, those two cultures that appeal to him so much. Um, and that made it, his ability to, to become part of it without ever claiming that he really was, you know, like he never did that. Uh, his talent as a translator, translator as scholar, translator as poetry translator, um, made it possible. It's enriched his work as a translator, but his own love of language and poetry, I think, enriched his life as an adopted Tlingit person, as a Russian church member, um, a member of this community. Um, and I think he's absolutely right that um, translation from one culture into another is possible. It's never perfect, but it's possible, 
and that um, there are these themes that run through all cultures. As an anthropologist, maybe of the old school, I do believe in that very firmly. And I think contrary to some of the fashionable ideas about identity politics and dogmatism of today, which says that you know, there's Western culture and then there's indigenous culture and there's nothing in common and we really don't, you know, if we want to study native culture and practice it, we don't need that other culture. I disagree with that and I think Dick did too. He never claimed to be a Tlingit. He deferred to Nora for her knowledge of the nuances of the language and the culture. But he was not afraid of making these comparisons and seeing Tlingit oral tradition as part of human culture as, you know, with capital H and capital C. His own poetry was tremendously enriched by images, ideas, metaphors, inspired by Tlingit culture and the beautiful landscape of Southeast Alaska, obviously, the Tlingitani. But one could never accuse him of appropriating Tlingit culture. This is something that um, we hear today, that you, know, you can't appropriate another culture. He never did that. He was enriched by it. Dick says um, on a number of occasions that a major part of his work was both to encourage the non-native people to overcome their prejudice against oral literature of the native people. And there was some resistance to what he was doing among educators. But he also says that in Language Warriors that he had to um, overcome some prejudice against the written culture, the writing of Tlingit language down the publishing of stories uh, from some of the older members of the community who insisted that this is an oral culture and you shouldn't be doing this publishing. Um, I think we're grateful that he and Nora were able to work with the elders and overcome some of those um, reservations that they had. So, For the sake of those who may not know the language but want to learn about their culture, about their rich heritage. So. Um, I share that, that feeling of his in my teaching, in my writing. Um, I feel myself that I've been enriched by my understanding of Tlingit culture and language and my friendship with um, many Tlingit people and having been adopted in the Tlingit clan, actually too, just like Dick was. Those are things that are very precious and they enrich me as a, as a scholar and a person. I want to end this... Um, presentation with a poem, reading a poem that Dick translated of Sergei Yesenin, a Russian poet of a very different era, uh, late imperial, early Soviet era. He was a peasant boy, became an a urban poet, a flamboyant kind of uh, gentleman. Um, he married Isadora Duncan, among other people. <laughs> he had several wives. But he died young. He actually killed himself, and I think he couldn't find his place in Soviet Russia in the 20s. He didn't feel at home there. And he wrote this very sad poem um, in his hotel room um, to his best friend. I'm not sure who the friend was, but um, the poem is about saying goodbye. And I felt that, in a way, this translation of Dick, which I really like a lot, um, may be a good way to complete and this presentation, um, in a way saying goodbye to Dick, although maybe not in such a tragic manner as this poem. So here's the poem published in 1920, uh, written in 1925. Farewell, my friend, farewell. I will keep you in my heart. It says, promised we will meet again, and it's fated that we must part. He's trying to do rhyming, which is what Russian poetry is rhymed at least most of it. Farewell, dear friend, no handshake and no word. I want no morning thoughts from you. To die is nothing new in life, but life, of course, is nothing new. So on that note, um, I want to stop. Uh, it is 8 o'clock, a little run over, but we didn't start on at 7. <laughs> I love to hear your questions, and I know s some of you either knew Dick very well or read his work. 
poetry and scholarly work, so uh, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Or if you didn't know him, maybe you now go and buy his book and read it, um, or buy his Tlingit translations. Lance. Uh, I want to thank you for talking about uh, my uncle. It, it's always good to, to see him and to hear about him. Uh, I, I particularly remember like his, his high-pitched laugh and, and how he would just kind of get rolling in laughter sometimes. Uh, and I appreciate you as a clan relative of mine uh, sharing your life experiences, uh, especially here at this place where, where he did so much phenomenal work. So my question is, uh, he left, you know, we're really in his, this place that he left in, in a lot of ways with the work that he did and that Nora did. So what do you think are the next steps to keep the Dauenhauer legacy going uh, in, in terms of their publications and other types of work? It's a great question, but in a way, you know the answer to it. <laughs> it's your job, my friend. <laughs> Yours and, and Ishmael hopes and, and the younger generation. Uh, and you had the privilege of, of learning from Richard and Nora and being with them. You know who they were and what they were like. So you can finish their work or at least do the best you can but also tell your students about them. Because, you know, times change and different ideas and, and fads come in and sometimes I, I see my students sometimes kind of underappreciate the scholars of the previous generations or talk about, you know, the white man's scholarship and the indigenous scholarship. Sometimes it's appropriate, but I think it's important to keep his memory alive, his legacy alive to tell the younger people, native and non-native, who, who he was. But it's, it's your job. And, and I, I must tell you something. When I was starting this work, I did ma mainly, most of my research was about traditional culture, the old ceremonies or how they were practiced. But it was that. That's what I was interested in. And I, I had a little bit of a romantic sort of view that, you know, with the passing of the elders in the 80s, and the fluent speakers numbers declining that um, I didn't know what will happen to the culture. I mean, I knew it would stay, it would be alive and well, but something would be lost. And I think something is always lost when the next generation is gone. But I became much more optimistic. And it's you guys who are working with you on um, clan conferences and just watching you grow as scholars and um, Ishmael is a poet, and a scholar, and a number of others. Chester, I mean, we could go on. You know who I'm talking about. I'm much more optimistic now that, um, yeah, I miss the elders because I knew them. Um, they were very special, a few are still around. And then there's the next generation of, you know, um, who, people of my age in their 60s, 50s. But ultimately, you know, I think there's still a lot of work to be done. So and I'm kind of rambling on, because it's a very emotional issue, not just for you, but for me, too. Um, and that's why I bring his poetry out, too, because it's just lingering there in archives. And he didn't finish. He didn't know he, he, had, he had a lot less time than um, was given to him. This book, um, you know, it opens with this quote from Dante to Nora, where he says, we're in the middle of the journey of our lives. And this is the year before he died, so, so that's my answer. But I, I, I also would like to help and support you guys as best I can, and I think this university does too. So, uh, but it's it's your uh, it's your cause, it's your job. Other questions? With your background as a Russian Jew and the Dalin Hours adopting the Russian Orthodox, I'm fascinated by the change from Russian America to American America. Could you characterize the view that the Russian 
head towards the Tlingit people. And when a lot has been written about it. I actually have a book about Russian, uh, Tlingit culture and Russian Orthodox Christianity through two centuries, starting with Baranov era and ending in the 70s when I was here. Um, I think there are fundamental differences, particularly the way um, some of the Russian missionaries uh, presented Christianity and were much more tolerant of Tlingit traditions. There's now a tendency, I think, to um, kind of paint the Russian era in this glowing colors and all the Russian missionaries were just as enlightened as Saint um, Innocent Benyaminov, which was not the case. They were also some very prejudiced and narrow-minded people, particularly in the later period, late 19th century, after the transfer. There's some missionaries who are just as nasty and, and um, narrow-minded, ethnocentric as some of the Protestant missionaries. So I think there is a big difference, but I, it's ironic that I spent a lot of time as a scholar describing the sort of the relation between Tlingit people and the Russians, but I'm really much, have always been much more interested in not so much what the Russians brought here. I'm not a historian of Russian Alaska per se, but how the native people interpreted what was presented. So that how aspects of the Russian church theology and ritual especially became part of native culture. And I think it was easier in some ways to do that uh, for, for Tlingit, particularly traditional, the more traditional Tlingit families uh, in Sitka where I did most of my work, but Juno as well. It was easier to make sense of some of the Russian theology. And think of some of you know about the 40 days memorial, which has become really part of the culture. It's between the funeral and the memorial. But the origins of 40 days is Russian Orthodox. And they just sort of blended. And I remember talking to some younger people way back who said, that's our culture, it's not Russian. And I said, yeah, it is now your culture, but the origins are, are, are Russian. So that's, that's very interesting. Um, so I don't know if I'm answering your question. You would take another lecture. Um, I think there were differences, but also the Russian American company was not uh, this benign, you know, liberal, wonderful outfit. That's the way it's now presented in Russia. As Russia becomes more nationalist, they talk about the Russian era as this golden age. Uh, and then the Americans came and everything went downhill from there. It's much more complicated. <laughs> but I also, I'm grateful to people like Lydia Black and who actually started studying Russian uh, era in, seriously. Because before her time we had Hector Chevigny and all the nonsense that was very little serious work and Bancroft and but most American historians didn't even read Russian, so how can you do Russian-American history or Alaska, uh, Russian-era Alaskan history without knowing Russian? So here's another project there. Any more questions? <coughs> Kathy. Thank you, well it's not so much a question as um, letting everybody know that we've been able to, um, I'm the literary executor for the Dan Howers on the English side. James Crippen is the literary executor on the Clinkett side. And um, since their deaths, we've been able to um, have a poetry reading and memory um, event on their birthdays. The chancellor has kindly given us the, um, um, the, the, the conference room. So I'll try to do, um, much announcement as I can. And then I also particularly am interested in Glacier Bay Concerto, so if there's anyone wants to do a um, day on that, uh, please let me know. But I just wanted you to know that we, re we revive every year our memories um, uh, of, of Dick and Nora. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. One of the most um, important lessons, I think, um, I've learned from Tlingit culture in a way, from the research, but also from the people, is this idea that we don't die, only part of us dies. Our names and our memories are passed down. And it's something that I learned early on, you know, watching little kids being named in the Tlingit memorial rituals, and people talking about their ancestors as if they're still here. 
Um, I try to pass that on to my students. I teach this course on anthropology of death and dying, and a big part of that is trying to explain to them how Alaska Native people, particularly Tlingit, how they view you know, death and, and immortality, and, and it's very different. Um, and I, I feel like it's enriched my life. And of course, when I started this research, I was in my 20s, and you know, I'm in my 60s, it's 40 years. And as we get older, we also have different perspective on, on loss and, and um, future. And also, I didn't have children yet when I came here, and I have a daughter. So I look at her as she's gonna carry on my name and hopefully have children of her own. <laughs> But you know what I'm talking about. But I learned it comes from my own tradition, Russian and Jewish, but I think in the Tlingit culture there's this wonderful view of um, there's no finality, especially as long as we remember the ones we lost, pass down their names, remember them um, you know, in ceremony, wear their beautiful regalia, then, then they're alive, they're with us. I, I'm sure it's, for some of you this is so obvious, but. I, I felt I want to mention that. <laughs> also, I must say, I've criticized the Russian historians of today. There are exceptions, and the, my favorite historian is actually Andrei Grinov, uh, who studies Russian uh, era history, and he's not a nationalist, which is an unusual <laughs> quality nowadays. There are few Russian historians who are willing and able and not afraid to criticize their own history. Because now even the government, the Ministry of Culture says that historians of Russia should produce works that are beneficial to the state and don't say anything negative about the state. So it's serious. So Andrei is about to publish a book on, uh, it's a translation of his Russian book, monumental doctoral thesis on Russian Alaska. And it's so large that we decided to break it up into three volumes. <laughs> So the first volume's coming out, and it's just the 18th century, pre-1799. It's coming out with Nebraska. And he was here for the Klan conference. Uh, uh, so um, there are some good people. And, and there's some America, Russians, uh, American scholars of Russian descent who are also working on this without the political um, you know, limitations and ideological um, hang-ups and all that kind of stuff. Of course, there are even Russian some historians, mostly popular, and politicians who still believe that this is Rush, this should be Russian, and it was never sold, you know. And it's more, more, of, more of a, you know, I don't think they plan to exercise, <laughs> but they talk about it a lot. And Putin does, too. Um, you know the joke about uh, um, Putin calls Obama and says, you know, we have a new name for Alaska. We call it ice cream. <laughs> this is after they occupied Crimea. <laughs> anyway, I just, um, yeah. Um, also, I think there's always a difference between the theology of the church and the philosophy and the language and the poetry I try to read and the politics and the people in charge. And uh, there's such a, you know, discrepancy. And sometimes we forget that. The one, and I love Russian culture, but I'm very disappointed with what's going on there. And I haven't been there in years because I'm just, I don't want to go back there. Um, I may have to because I have family and a few friends still left, but it's, even compared to 10, 15, 20 years ago, it's a very different country. Uh, it's certainly a very different political system. I don't know if Alan agrees with me or not. Anyways, um, I think the poet also lives through his poetry, so not just and his scholarship, but um, we have these books, so makes good reading. <laughs> I just want to thank you personally, Rick, for inviting me and. Um, I come here anyway because I have so many things I want to do in, in Southeast, so many people to see, but this is a great opportunity and I look forward to working with Kathy on helping sort out Dick's uh, archive and library, particularly the Russian part of it. So thank you so much. Good night. Cheers.
ran over time, but I don't.